everybody um, to this uh, second week of the of the school. Um, thank you very much for being here. Uh, so today uh, we are going to be have a different format compared to the ones we are used to from uh, last week. So today uh, is my uh, pleasure to introduce the lecturer of today who is uh, Jordi Vasconte. Uh, Jordi is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology uh, at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. And uh, his uh, um, research is mostly focused on ecological network and in particular on mutualistic networks. So you have, uh, as you know, uh, Jordi Vasconte has uploaded two uh, record, pre-recorded lectures uh, that were available on uh, the website uh, starting last week. And uh, this session of today is um, a Q&A session. Uh, so it's an opportunity to discuss uh, with, uh, uh, with Jordi uh, the material presented in the lectures and I think I go also a little bit beyond uh, that. So thank you very much, uh, Jordi, for, for uh, pre recording the lectures and for being uh, with us. Thanks to you, Jacopo. It's really a pleasure and uh, I welcome everybody. And so now we are uh, open to questions. So if you um, have any question on either of the two, uh, the two lectures, please use the uh, raise hand button uh, of Zoom or uh, write it in the chat or if you're following from YouTube, you can write it in the chat of YouTube. So uh, we have a hand raised by Silvia. So Silvia, if you want to ask the question, please unmute and ask. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. So I have a question uh, on the first uh, lecture concerning mm -hmm. how the nested structure emerges. Um, in fact, like in general, one could hypothesize that the structure could emerge either from the ecological dynamics or from the evolutionary dynamics, right? And mm -hmm. on Friday, we heard a lecture by Stefano Alesina that was uh, talking about community assembly. And we learned that there will be a structure in the interactions only if there was a structure in the original pool of species. So this would suggest that the nested structure can only emerge from the evolutionary dynamics. So could you comment on this? And is there any of your works where you dealt with um, how the nested structure can emerge? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, thanks for posing that. Um, I think that as we've learned more about uh, these ecological networks and, uh, and, and the suite of mechanisms that are compatible with, with the structure, we tend to move from uh, an, an initial focus where people uh, were picking up a particular mechanism to considering like simultaneous mechanisms um, uh, that can potentially be at work here. So early on, right after the first wave of studies describing the structure of these networks, people um, start focusing on particular mechanisms. For example, one of those is species abundance. So people realize that um, if most abundant species tend to uh, be more uh, available, by chance, it's more likely that species would tend to interact with these more, more abundant than less abundant species. So this kind of neutral uh, approach become um, one important um, mechanism in generating networks. At the same time, other people were focusing on other aspects. For example, a phylogenetic signal is well known that there is this uh, phylogenetic signal meaning that species close in the phylogeny tend to play similar roles in the network of interactions. What this is suggesting is that past evolutionary history uh, may be important in understanding uh, contemporary patterns of network uh, built up. So for a while, as, in, as it tends to happen in science, it seemed like there was a little bit of a, of a, of a competition between um, specific um, mechanisms. I think where we are standing today is in a place where we recognize that there's a suite of mechanisms. There's not only one mechanism. So ecology certainly plays a role because um, species abundance, it's important in order to explain these patterns, but it, it, most likely it's, it's not enough. And it's true that this coexists with this um, evolutionary signal with trade matching, for example, which is another set of explanations that emphasize that trades 
are the currency that explains interactions. And therefore, for example, one trait would be the length of a pollinator stone. Another uh, trait could be the length of a, a, a plant's corolla, a flower's cor corolla. And therefore, um, whether or not there's a matching between traits may be key in order to explain those interactions. So what I think it's now um, uh, the, 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 the state where we are is in trying to understand, not, not proving that this is the mechanism or that's the mechanism, but in trying to uh, weigh the relative importance of a series of mechanisms, always taking into account the phylogenetic structure, because in these comparative studies, one cannot forget that species are not independent units, but they um, uh, form part of, uh, of this uh, uh, of, of, of this process of uh, related species uh, coming uh, uh, from an ancestor or origin. So that's, that's where I think we are right now. I think that uh, evolutionary mechanisms certainly are important, what you were emphasizing, but there are other set of mechanisms like, like ecological ones. And I don't think there's um, nothing wrong on that. I think, I think that as with many other things in, in science, uh, a pluralistic view, uh, is most likely gonna gonna be at war. So yes, I would highlight uh, evolutionary mechanisms, uh, trade mechanisms, and, and and neutral or species abundance mechanisms. If I can ask just a, a, a little sure. clarification on this, like when you mentioned the importance of abundance, so are the species that are most uh, generalist typically the more abundant ones? Yes, that's something that uh, people. Uh, relies from an early stage. And if something the debate was, I mean, are species uh, more abundant because they are more generalist or the other way around? So that's a little bit where the, the discussion was. But for, for, uh, uh, for, from very much uh, the early stage of these studies on ecological networks, and in particular, these mutualistic networks, it was, uh, it was clear, and, and, and particularly I'm thinking about the Great War by, by Diego Vázquez in Argentina and colleagues, that um, abundance was, was, really, was really important. The thing, though, is that, um, uh, for example, going back to our own work, we had um, a paper laid by a former student, um, uh, um, uh, Abe Krishna, that uh, proved with a simple model that while abundance is important, when you combine abundance with, with, um, with trait matching, the fit to the data is, is even higher. Great. So, uh, Silvia, you wanted to follow up or? No, I'm fine. Thank you very much Thanks. for the answer. Great. So there is a, um, a question from uh, uh, Washington, Taylor. Yeah, hi, thanks. Yeah, I thought your lecture was very interesting. You found some, there's some nice, clear and simple ways of uh, starting to address some really interesting and deep questions. I had actually two uh, somewhat unrelated questions. Maybe I'll throw both of them at you and you can choose which one or, or uh, address them in whichever order you want. So one is you focused on climate as a driver of extinction events and as kind of a primary thing throughout your lecture. But as I'm sure you're, you're very well aware, you know, mo most of the things currently driving species extinction are other things like habitat loss you know, human use of ecosystem pollution and invasive species and things like that. So the first question is whether um, those would have a similar impact or whether there are some climate specific signatures in what you were describing. Um, and then the second question is um, when you describe these, these essentially two level networks, I mean, of course, in a real ecosystem, there's all kinds of very subtle other species playing niche roles that are mediating interactions and maybe playing key roles as, uh, you know, in, in all kinds of places in the, in the system. So I'm wondering whether that you've explored whether there's any sense in which these networks you have are robust against intermediate species that are involved in the, in the system going extinct or you know how, how that plays in the, the missing pieces that you don't have in the network so those are sort of two questions yes these these are very great uh, questions going back to the first one you're totally right i mean uh, climate change is just one driver of global environmental change the other being uh, habitat fragmentation or uh, uh, nitrogen deposition and, and so on. Um, while our focus was here, probably probably the, um, the reason we're focusing on climate change is for historical reasons, because from early on there was this attempt of bridging between these uh, uh, somehow um, 
distant approaches, one the network approach and the other the the, the climate um, climate change ecology, right? So uh, to some extent, focus focusing on climate uh, uh, was um, a consequence of uh, these two uh, different approaches. Uh, but um, there's been a previous work uh, by, by by other people who focus on on habitat uh, transformation. Some of this work is is theoretical, using models of habitat loss, habitat fragmentations, and looking at uh, what's the rate and shape of, of network uh, collapse. And um, I I would say I would I would expect finding the the, the same type of uh, 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 qualitative results. I don't think. Those results were quite specific about about climate in terms of the rate and shape of collapse, in terms of like uh, uh, finding this uh, phylogenetic signal or, or having a moment where the, the the rules of the game, so to speak, change, and then uh, uh, we're focusing uh, different species from the from the phylogenetic tree. So I I, I would say those are uh, quite uh, general results, although to be totally honest only um, a subset of these questions uh, have been addressed using other drivers of climate change. So here I'm, uh, I'm kind of uh, telling a little bit my, my gut feeling. For example, the one it's for sure similar is this uh, kind of abrupt collapse, this idea that the, the consequence as, as, as we are moving through this um, axis of global environmental change, the thing that early on nothing seems to change too much up to a point where suddenly there's a, a collapse. That's the kind of result that different people have seen when looking at different, at different drivers, right? Uh, the other ones, uh, I'm not so uh, well aware of studies, the, the ones looking, for example, at, at how functional diversity is eroded or, or um, evolutionary history is eroded. But my gut feeling would be that these are quite have to be quite general uh, uh, consequences. So I would expect a similar kind of signal. Mm -hmm. um, in, in relation to the other question, that, that's very interesting. It's true that um, one should expect having this kind of, uh, if you want keystone species, species that play uh, a major role in bringing the network, um, the network together. And uh, that's, that's a, a piece of research that has focus on that, but in my view, it's more a static one. For example, research looking at the modularity or, or compartmentalization of these networks. This research tends to look not only at this tendency uh, to be organized in modules, but also at the role that different uh, species play, and in particular, this role by a few species in, 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 in bridging across different modules in being the sort of, of the glue that keeps this module uh, together. Now, if um, if I understood your, your question correctly, you, you were asking whether some studies have focused on what happens when, when these species disappear, right? And, um, and um, I, ca I can think of, of a study uh, that was uh, looking at, um, at, 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 at a genetic diversity of, of, of some of these species that emphasized this thing that uh, uh, once you remove one of these species, you can have a major change because suddenly you can have a network that previously was more or less cohesive, and now you have like a, a collection of, of, of different networks. Great. No, thanks. Those are great answers to both questions. And on the second question, I guess one, if I could just go a little further on that. So I guess one of the things I was also asking about there was you have this database of interactions between different species in these different habitats. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, probably there are important species that were missed in each of those databases. So, for instance, you may have 73 species in a given area, but there may be another 30 species that really play a keystone role. So part of the question is, even if you missed some of those key species and those were somehow just encoded uh, secretly in the interactions, are the, are the results that you're getting robust against, say, replacing the network with one where you imagine that you only know about a, sub, a subset of the species and then test the same hypotheses. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're totally right. And that's the kind of, um, uh, I would say that encapsulates uh, a series of criticism that uh, was about uh, using these uh, large database studies where, you know, I mean, um, it was a, a nice attempt in the sense of looking at generality, but uh, there are trade-offs and the, 
uh, part of the consequence of that, and, and I, I, I think it's a fair point, part of the consequence of people who were more critical about um, our work and the work by, by many others for the, same, uh, for the same sake, was that each of these networks has been compiled by a different uh, author or a different team spending different time or using slightly different methodologies and therefore um, in the same way that when looking at um, studies on species diversity, it's very clear now, pretty much everybody knows and understands that we, we should use uh, rarefaction cubes. We were not at this stage. And that, uh, that uh, uh, arise some questions about the value of this generality. Now there's been now, uh, um, as, as, as the, the field mature and this kind of studies become a little bit more, more mature, there has been already a subset of those that start using similar methodologies and, and in particular use these uh, rarefaction curves. And this allows two things. First, it, it allows to focus on the smaller subset of networks that have been sampled uh, enough, so have a similar level of sampling and then focusing on, on those, but also like looking at how these properties may change across a, a, a gradient in, in sampling. And there are properties that may uh, vary quite a lot, but some of these properties do not vary uh, that much. Like in particular, that nested structure I was emphasizing during that particular um, uh, first talk, it's one that it's a little bit like the different peels of, of an onion, right? Essentially, you have this, this uh, core of, of generalist species and then these few um, generalists thing is that if you sample more, you start having a longer tail of a species. And, and normally those species tend to be uh, specialists and to be uh, uh, less common species, that, but also they tend to attach to the most generally. So depending on the type of, of, of um, dimension of a structure, if you want, or perspective, this may not uh, depend that much on, on, um, on the level of sampling. But in general, I think that's a poor, a poor answer. And I think that now what we should try to do is every new study, try to have a sort of a rare, rarefaction curves. And people can do that in the same way that we look at how many different species we have when we sample 100, 500, 1,000 individuals. We can do the same, for example, with the number of interactions. And oftentimes, we have enough of a sample that people consider a little bit of an uh, asymptote. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks a lot. My pleasure. Uh, great. So the next one in line is uh, uh, Alfonso. So Alfonso, please uh, um, unmute yourself. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for your great lecture. And my, my first question is, that can the mutualistic networks account for weighted interaction, interaction between plants and insects. And if, in that case, uh, how much the distribution of these weights might change uh, the results uh, or the number of a species, the maximum number of a species supported by the network or the change of extinctions in case that, in the case of non-random uh, extinction, like the co-extinction that you talk about in the lecture. And my second question, I just come up with uh, that question uh, recently, is that is there a relation of in like uh, generalist species tend to be more abundant? My, my, my question is related with the species abundance distribution, if the, there are a relation between the species abundance distribution of a community and the network structure. Very good. Uh, very good uh, set of questions. Let me start by, by the second one. The answer is, is yes. And some of these uh, uh, approaches we were referring to uh, uh, a few minutes ago in terms of like uh, checking the relative role of, uh, of a different uh, mechanisms in explaining network structure. One of those, this kind of a neutral approach, was using these observed skew uh, species abundance relationships. And then um, for the plants on one hand, for the animals on the other, 
and then assuming that the probability of drawing an interaction is going to be proportional to the to the product of this species abundance. So it's, it's kind of simultaneously taking into account both the skew distribution for both sets, right? And um, when one does something like that, you, you come up with a network of, of interactions that tends to be similar than um, the one we observe uh, in nature. So people would tend to think, okay, that's, uh, uh, that, that kind of supports the idea that uh, neutral processes, species abundance is certainly important. Again, as I said, when you have a model that takes into account this and other factors, you can get an even uh, better fit, which uh, tends to support the idea that there's no only one mechanism, but most likely a suite, a suite of, of mechanisms. So you are totally right. Species abundance and, and the particular um, empirical distributions is something that may be uh, very important and has been empirically used in order to um, come up with a expectation of these network of interactions and then matching that expectation with the, with the observed one. I don't know if that answered your, your question. Yes, I, I think that, that answered my question. Lovely. Then in, in, in regards to the first one, uh, you are totally right. I think um, my talk, you probably realize that my, uh, I mean, when I give this talk on mutualistic networks, now it's a talk that uh, spans uh, now 20 years. So early on, when we were mainly looking at the structure, I was um, going through different levels of structure and focusing on, on interaction strength. As, as more results were packed, I, I, I tend to reduce the focus on, on the structure and just focus on that particular dimension, the nested one, but you are totally right. And although early on, the first set of, of papers were looking at binary data, and that refers to, for example, this nested pattern I, I was talking about, but also this connectivity distributions, whether they are they follow power law or a truncated power law or an exponential that was like the kind of things people in network research were doing at the same at the, at the, at the time. Um, I mean, a few people again uh, were critical about that, and they would say that okay, all the results may be uh, uh, meaningful without like considering embracing the fact that there may be a huge variability in the wave in the strength of those interactions. And actually, there was uh, a few studies that were looking at the structure, but using weighted data. In that big repository I, I, I mentioned during my, my talk, uh, right now there's almost half of these networks that contain information not only on who interacts with whom, but on the relative weight of this interaction. Oftentimes, this is uh, the surrogate of, of um, frequency of interactions is used or, or number of fruits uh, removed, for example, things among those lines. So there's this kind of information and some of these studies describing network structure were focusing on that component. For example, they were looking at the dependence of an animal in a plant, like uh, for, and, and they were focusing or they were highlighting this idea of a, a symmetry in the interaction which can be also observed in binary data. One of the results of a nested pattern is this asymmetry in the sense that specialists tend to interact with the most generalists. Now, when you look at weighted network, you can see that this also happens in, the, in, the, in a pairwise scale. So like, for example, a plant that depends very much on an animal for, um, for uh, its pollination, norm normally you encounter that the animal depends very little on that particular plant. So some of the results you can still see uh, when you move from binary to weighted networks. And other results only make sense or only kind of tools or approaches when you have um, a, a weighted network. So overall, um, yes, you have this kind of information. You can address new questions that you could not with a, with a binary data. Uh, and a, a few questions you can check with both. And uh, I would say you tend to find like uh, similar, uh, similar uh, patterns. Great, uh, Alfonso, you have a follow-up or? No, I, I think that that answers was really nice. So thank you very much. Thanks to you for the question. Great, so uh, next in line is uh, Violeta. Uh, yes, uh, hi, hello. Uh, hi, thank you, Jordi. Hello. Uh, yes, my question is uh, about the structural stability. 
more precise. Uh, trade off Hello. there okay for me it's crystal clear how uh, do you infer the nastiness of the network you just measure it with some algorithm but uh, what about the mutualistic trade-off I, I mean uh, how have you inferred this mutualistic trade-off because then if you see the equations the generalized lot cover equations there the, the parameter space is multi-dimensional and very very wide so I suppose that you just chose certain parameters, but uh, can we be sure that uh, the, the about the general generality of, of the results doing doing that? Yes, in terms of how uh, one does this, on one hand, you have for these uh, weighted networks, you have empirical information. Essentially, that's information that relates uh, the degree how many species a focal species interact with, that may be two, five, or 10 species, but you also have information on the weight of each one of these interactions, right? So this is information that you have empirically from the network. So that, that means that you can determine where the point is in that figure, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of how to um, explore, it's very much similar than with nestedness. I mean, uh, with nestedness, uh, you take the network as it is, and then you randomize that uh, with a series of assumptions. Normally, you, you tend to preserve total number of plants, total number of animals, uh, total number of interactions, and uh, approximately who, uh, uh, how many interactions each species has. With the trade, obviously, a bit the same. You could have like um, a randomization where you maintain the degree of each species, right? You maintain like... Uh, uh, like the number of interactions they have, but, but you can shuffle the weights of each one of those interactions. So that would allow you to explore that axis in, in mm -hmm. parameter space. But anyway, that axis is also related with the intrinsic growth rate of the species and also the competition's parameter. So all well, of that, those... That, that axis... And it's, it's not related to anything else because it's, it's the way you define it. You define an axis like being only a value of nestedness and then it's only structural and you can change it. What it's related to these other parameters and in particular to growth rates, which is, this was the, the variable we we're looking at, is in terms of the measure of structural stability. So on one hand, you have uh, parameters that define the structure, the structure of the network and then you use um, uh, growth rates as a way to quantify uh, how much variability in those growth rates the model can cope with before one or more species is driven extinct. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. So there's a little bit of an uncoupling, no? Some of these uh, variables of, of network structure are, are just used to, to show uh, how much variability you could have and then for each level of variability, uh, the demographic uh, parameters are used in order to explain uh, the, the, the range in growth rates in this case in particular. So you, you choose like the, 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 the center of this uh, domain, the center where uh, this domain of feasibility, where all the species can coexist. There's, there's ways by which you can focus on, on that center. And then you um, start uh, perturbing growth rates, changing growth rates, increasing, 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 up to the point where one or more species uh, disappear. So there's a little bit of a decoupling on how you treat these different um, different parameters. Okay, but when sorry, just the last question. Yeah, but yeah, when sure. when you are uh, varying the range of the intrinsic growth rate, there in your equations you must fixed uh, the other betas and, and yes. gammas. So, yes. it, it, so maybe it happens that for those certain parameters of gamma and, and betas, your intrinsic growth rate behaves in some way, but maybe there's a tiny region where they don't. So is that actually important or not? Yes, you are totally right. And to be, uh, uh, I mean, to make a long story short, 
uh, essentially that's for a specific values of, of the other parameters. One, what one can do is then repeat the analysis for a, 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 another value for each one of these parameters. So this gives you an idea of how uh, robust results are for variation in the other parameters. But to be uh, to be honest with you, essentially that's more like, okay, you fix the other parameters and then you, you focus on variability on growth rates. And yes, you cannot rule out the possibility that there, there may be some combination of parameters where, 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 where now uh, you, you could have a, a, a slightly larger or, or, or a smaller range of conditions compatible with, with feasibility. You are right. It's, it's, a, it's a very complex uh, a problem just because of the yes. multidimensional uh, lithium parameters. So to some extent, you, 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 you fix some of the parameters and then you focus on, on growth rates. So it's, it's, if you want, it's a partial account of the much more complex variability in parameter space. Okay, no, but thank you. Thank you very much. Very Great. interesting. <laughs> Great, thanks a lot for the questions. So the next in line is uh, Martina. Hi, hello, and Hi, thank you for, for your lectures. Uh, so one is, a, I have two questions. One is a clarification, the other one is more general. So maybe I'll start with clarif the clarification. So when you were talking about extinctions that were driven by climate uh, compared to extin the secondary extinctions that are driven by interactions, mm -hmm. uh, you had those uh, um, phylogenetic trees uh, and with the circles. Uh, and uh, you were saying that you can predict the, um, let's say the um, uh, direct extinctions uh, with the geographic location, where, whether you predict the others with the traits. And I was wondering, uh, Maybe it's completely wrong. Never ID, sorry, just to be precise. The, the single most important variable in explaining coextinction is what we call network ID, so a, a property of the network, yes. Okay, and I, and I was wondering whether, okay, if you have interactions, uh, you're supposed to you have them in the same location. So I was wondering how can you get these, uh, say, switching the first predictor? Uh, essentially, the way is... Uh, by using these uh, generalized linear models where you can have different factors. Uh, one is a geographic location, the other it's, it's, it's a factor called a network ID, so a, a property of the network which it's, it's unique and it, it's not affected by the others. And then through this kind of a statistical approach, you can, um, uh, you can weigh the relative contribution of one of these uh, uh, variables accounting for the other ones. So it's a way by which you can focus on the relative role of geographic location while keeping into account, uh, if you want keeping fixed the, 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 the role of, of network ID, that's one component. And the other one is, uh, or, or the, the complement to that, is by using um, what's called a, a, a Kaikis information criteria because other things being equal, I mean, the more variables you have in the in a model, right, the better it gets. But you have to penalize it. To some extent, it's 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 an artifact or, or just a corollary of uh, of having more variables. So the idea is to really uh, uh, um, focus on the variables, right, that uh, explain um, uh, um, the variability in a model, uh, taking into account the the number of variables or the dimensionality of, of, of the model itself. So that's a kind of a statistical approach uh, to uh, come up with this kind of, uh, kind of results. So essentially, it's, um, it's, it's uh, uh, statistically, you can do that. Even when you have several variables, uh, these kind of models allow you to focus on one variable at the time and kind of uh, yeah. give, give, give you the relative relevance of that variable while keeping the others uh, uh, constant and also the interaction because sometimes then, uh, the interaction between uh, between factors or variables or sometimes it's not just that uh, uh, variable uh, uh, x or, or variable y are important but sometimes you can also find a significant um, interaction between these two variables and so given it, uh, these models, so it, the network ID is in the fixed part or in the random part? That's a good point. To be honest, now I don't remember if we treat it as a, as a random factor. Um, okay. This I cannot remember now, 
but um, no, it's fine. I can I can read the paper from. Yes, I mean I'm sure the 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 details are are there are there, and um, because that that that's a very interesting thing, and it's not trivial the way um, uh, people who are um, uh, uh, really knowledgeable about these these models, the the way they treat um, these um, these uh, factors as either a random or a fix, that depends very much on the structure of the question, but also a little bit the constraints or the limitations of, of the data. So again, uh, if you are interested, details are, are there. I, I, I just do not remember now. OK, OK. Uh, and the other one is more general. So you, you find this uh, very nice relationship between nestedness and biodiversity. And uh, do you know what happens if you have modularity on the x-axis? That's a very good point. I, I, we, we've not really checked that in the context of that uh, of that framework. Um, so I cannot give you like a, a, a solid answer to that question just because we did not check. Obviously, one could think about these two dimensions of network structure not being totally independent, but somehow related. And although it's not perfect relationship, people tend to assume that the, the higher the nestedness, the lower modularity. That's not necessarily the case because that depends on a level of connectivity. So below, below the threshold of connectivity for low connectivities, you actually find a, a, a positive relationship. You, you, you find the networks which are more nested, they are also more modular. But when, when the network um, is, uh, is well connected, you find this kind of inverse relationship. So one could conclude that because of that, uh, you would find uh, the opposite sort of, 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 of trend. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Great, so, um, uh, Martina, okay, no, I think, uh, okay. So we can move on with the uh, Sri uh, Rama. Thank you, Professor, for your talks. Am I audible? I hope I am audible. Hello? Hi. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I could not hear you very yes. well. Sorry, no, am I audible? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, so actually I have a general question. Suppose if you take a generalist predators or anything, they have some preferential structure. So there's something like optimal forages. So what happens is every time the uh, network structure changes because they can prefer one prey or another prey. So the network becomes a dynamics. Yes. So how this dynamic network can be modeled generally? That's an excellent point. Uh, you are totally right. And one of the uh, limitations of, of the last part of my talk, talking about these uh, models of climate change, is that we were not taking into account that. So essentially, in this kind of uh, approach, and also the approach by, by, by many others, the thing is that uh, once a species runs out of, of, of resources or, or the fraction of resources disappear, those species have a higher probability of being driven uh, coextinct. And uh, we know that things are a little bit more complicated because, as you already point out, uh, there is a trophic uh, flexibility. The fact that some species, whenever their favorite prey items uh, uh, are not abandoned enough, they can shift to, to um, another one. So, I mean, to my knowledge, the very first person who put um, brought this forward was Mikio Kondo, a, th uh, a theoretical ecologist based in Japan, that in a paper in, in science, that's probably now 15, uh, about 15 years uh, ago, uh, proved that this flexibility can uh, certainly shift. And, and he was focusing on the relationship between stability and complexity. It can, it can be shifted. So when you have uh, trophic flexibility, you can see that uh, more uh, complex uh, food webs tend to be more, um, more uh, stable. Also in the context of mutualistic networks, uh, people and, and Fernanda Baldovinos, it's, a, it's a, a good example, have shown that this uh, uh, relationship between stability and complexity can largely uh, uh, change through that uh, trophic flexibility. So I would say that um, the sort of models that we and others have used Ignoring trophic flexibility would be a sort of worst case scenario. Whenever you have a trophic flexibility, things uh, uh, become a little bit better. But I would say that some of the qualitative results, for example, the, 
the existence of, of these tipping points are still there, only that you can shift the tipping point uh, to higher values of habitat loss or, or, or species extinctions and things like, like that. I think now the question though, is how to really bring a biologically informed a model of, 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 um, of network rewiring. This is what uh, we are trying to do now in the lab with uh, Marilia Gallarza. And I think that, again, that phylogenetic signal can be key here. The fact that, okay, although uh, there's a potential for uh, rewiring, oftentimes this is not going to be random. So uh, uh, any species will most likely not have the possibility to shift to any other item. But we think that it may be a good, um, uh, a, a good starting point to consider phylogenetic signal, me meaning that if one species runs out of, of uh, resources, most likely may, uh, may shift towards resources that uh, a species close in the phylogeny uh, depends on. So I think, I think that would be a good uh, way to start uh, introducing this rewiring a little bit um, in a more biologically informed way than just assuming every species has a probability to rewire with any other species randomly picked in the community. Uh, can I add one thing? Generally, most of this uh, optimal phrasing is something, suppose they are not able to uh, see that if there is not preferring, they are not, uh, and the feeding may not be giving the uh, required growth or anything, they will divert to another species. So that means the uh, something like, uh, uh, suppose if, if they are seeing that uh, we are having a lot of energy we are uh, uh, spending in time of predation, but we are not getting lo uh, required energy to our growth, then we have to shift for another species. So how can you do this? Uh, uh, that is what actually my question. I mean, I don't know I'm able to properly convey that or not, because I'm not a biologist, I'm a mathematician, I'm working in this area, so. Yeah, I think it's a very good point. I mean, to be, to be honest, we know very little about that. And the reason is again, because this, this kind of studies have gone uh, quite independent from each other. A little bit, I was emphasizing that independence between network research and climate change research, right? And that was a little bit of the, rational for, uh, for us trying to bridge them. Uh, another another uh, big gap uh, exists between these models of uh, or this approach of ecological networks that tend to be quite uh, static and this optimal foraging, which obviously emphasized a dynamic component. No? I think um, it would be a very interesting uh, uh, direction to try to bridge those. And for example, try to see what would be the predictions? What would come up out of these uh, basic ideas of optimal foraging? So, for example, allowing like a, a few species of animals to forage, forage in a, on a given uh, um, landscape, and then trying to see how out of these basic rules of optimal foraging, what kind of network structure would, would, would arise. I think there's a little bit of that. I, I seem to recall a paper uh, probably by, by Morales and perhaps uh, Diego Vázquez as well. Uh, I may be wrong, but I think I think these are the, the authors who tried to do that. And, and that was uh, certainly very, very interesting, but I think there's there's uh, lots of room to kind of expand this, this kind of bridging between optimal foraging and, and network structure. Thank you, thank you. My pleasure. Uh, great. So we are going at very high pace. <laughs> yeah. So there is another question by uh, Ankit. Uh, hi. Hello. Yeah. Thank you for this very broad survey of uh, mutualistic networks. So I had a question regarding, uh, like, which is somewhat related to May's result of stability in large, complex ecosystems. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, obviously, he looks at uh, like entirely random networks, but let's say if you talk about large uh, mutualistic networks, where you have some asymmetry between the number of plants and, and the animals, like let's say there are very few plants, but many animals which uh, like depend on these uh, uh, plants. So in that case, like, is there a theoretical result of like stability in the same sense as uh, me or like, yeah, or like, is it difficult to like define that because 
I guess in such a setting, you would have a lot of negative interactions instead of like just uh, totally random interactions. Yeah. What, what do you mean by negative interactions? Non, non-random, just uh, non-random? Yeah, yeah, random negative interactions, but they don't sum up to zero. I mean, like the interactions of the entire matrix. Yeah. Yes, that, that's a very good point. You're you totally right. I mean, uh, Bob, Bob's made great paper has to be has to be seen as like a baseline expectation. So some some of the criticism the paper had actually uh, did not arise uh, because of the paper itself, but our our uh, faulty way of interpreting that that paper. So we could not interpret that May said that most complex communities have to be unstable. Rather, what he said is that our baseline expectation, if communities were randomly organized, is that there's a limit to to uh, uh, complexity. And therefore, I think that paper was uh, uh, extremely influential in, 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 in shaping the field in many directions. One of those was just asking ourselves what may be those uh, mechanisms or these uh, dimensions of structure that can help reconcile being complex and being uh, stable. So yeah, there's um, our, our, our original work on um, trying to bridge between uh, this uh, network structure and, and stability that was uh, uh, our, our science paper in 2006, we tried to do that in, in following um, a very similar approach than, than uh, Bob, Bob May with lots of limitations. I mean, that was uh, our first attempt and uh, therefore we had to simplify a lot of things. And, but what, what I want to emphasize in, in the context of your question is that Yes, you come up with a, a, um, an equation for the uh, linear stability and feasibility condition for both being feasible and linearly stable that very much resembles uh, 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 Bob May. Essentially, you have in Bob May, you have that the average uh, strength of interactions has to be lower than an amount amount that involves number of species and, and connectivity. So what you have here is a similar thing, but instead of having like um, the average strength of interactions, you have the average product of the strength of interaction of the animal and the strength of interaction of the, of the plant. And this is what has to be less than an amount. And that, uh, we, we, that allow us to, to predict that what's relevant in these mutualistic networks is that either you have uh, species that depend very little on others, or when one species depends a lot on a second, that second is, depends very little in the one. So even when one term is, is large, if the other is very, very small, the product still remains, uh, remains uh, sm small. So that would be an example of a very similar kind of criteria than uh, Bob May, but uh, it, it had some interesting variability in that variability allow us to start like thinking about um, how these dependencies of a plant and an animal and the animal on that plant uh, have to be rearranged to keep a stable communities. Yeah, thanks. I'll also look at your uh, paper. In Lovely, thank you. Thanks. Great. So uh, is there any other question? I don't see anyone uh, with the uh, raise hand uh, in the participant list uh, and no one, no question in the chat, uh, but we had a 50 minute, very intense uh, question session. So I think that if uh, no one has a question, we can uh, uh, um, move forward. Great. Well, I think it was this was a sort of uh, experiment for us to have these pre-record sessions uh, plus question. But I uh, personally think it worked very, very well, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, to thank uh, Jordi for being with us and uh, for uh, answering answering uh, all the questions as well as uh, pre-recording the lectures. Thank, thanks, Jacopo, and thanks any uh, every one of you. I think you come up with uh, extremely good questions, and I think. Uh, a proof of that is that these are the questions that we are encountered when trying to publish papers. So in that regard, I, I, I think that uh, you are thinking um, very well. So I, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed and, and had a great time. So I like just to add that feel free to email if, if some of these ideas 
uh, uh, start developing or you have further uh, uh, a question, so just uh, drop an email and uh, it would be my pleasure to keep uh, discussing some, some of these ideas. And best luck uh, to every, every one of you. Hopefully you have a nice, uh, a nice uh, uh, school and, uh, and, a great, uh, and a great career. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Jordi, also for uh, your availability. And uh, so what we're going to do now uh, before the next lecture, which is, it will start in uh, about 20 minutes, is that we're going to split again in breakout rooms. Uh, so feel free to uh, chat uh, 